this is, even the first half, but certainly the second half, if we take these steps, what authority does the so-called federal government have to intervene in this? None! And not as a matter of we don't like them, like if you don't have authority, as a, which you may not. But even if we like to, you don't have this authority from a constitutional point of view. Here, at this level, the state, remember this is the state, okay? We're talking about this political institution. This is the state. The state has the constitutional authority to choose anything it wants as its medium of exchange. Even the Supreme Court said this in the late 1800s. Congress cannot require a state to use a form of currency that Congress has declared to be money. The example was the greenbacks. That was the Civil War. 1862. Treasury notes, legal tender treasury notes that were put out because the union government couldn't raise enough, it was afraid to raise taxes too high, and the banks were charging very high interest for loans. So Sam P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, came up with this legal tender, paid the money for three months. And not as a matter of we don't like them, type of you don't have authority. Oh, we don't. As a which you may not. <laughs> but even if we liked you, you don't have this authority from a constitutional point of view. Here, at this level, the state, remember, this is the state, okay? We're talking about this political institution. This is the state. The state has the constitutional authority to choose anything it wants as its medium of exchange. Even the Supreme Court said this in the late 1800s. Congress cannot require a state to use a form of currency that Congress has declared to be example was the greenbacks. That was the Civil War. 1862, treasury notes, legal tender treasury notes that were put out because the union government couldn't raise enough, it was afraid to raise taxes too high, and the banks were charging very high interest for loans. So Sam P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, came up with this legal tender, paper money theory, and that was put out. Gold and silver was still circulating, but people, Gresham's law, they kept it back from circulation. Gold and silver was still money, but it wasn't circulating regularly in the economy. The state of Oregon had a tax that required payment in gold and silver. And individuals said, well, I have these legal tender notes from Congress, and I can pay state tax in legal tender notes because Congress is authorized. The Supreme Court said no. Tax is a governmental function of the state. The states retain a certain amount of their original governmental sovereignty, and Congress, if it could interfere with that, it would completely strip them of their sovereignty. Ergo, what happens in the in the uh, instance where, like what FDR did? Where I'll get to that. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to stay here that long? <laughs> that was the first case, and then there was another one subsequently. Well, taxation is one, spending is another, borrowing, that's a good one. I mean, the state might want to borrow. And what's the best way to convince someone that those bonds are not going to be worthless 20 years from now? Put a gold clause in them, say they'll be payable in gold. That's for Franklin Roosevelt. See, if you waited just a minute, you would have the answer. That was Franklin Roosevelt. Because after that Civil War period, that's exactly what happened. People looked at this event, the generation of the paper money, which was actually irredeemable during the Civil War because Congress was not paying gold to anybody. After the war, those notes were made redeemable in gold or silver. But people looked at that and said, well, this event could happen again. And so to protect ourselves, we're going to write into our contracts gold clauses which say that we must be paid in gold coin. And those went in front of the Supreme Court because they're perfectly valid. Congress has created a multiplex, if you will, monetary system, gold and silver and paper, and you can choose to use whichever one you want if you specify it by contract, and those contracts are enforceable. And the courts are required actually to tell the debtor to pay in gold or silver. And as a result of that, essentially every long-term contract in the country had one of these clauses in it. Insurance contracts, industrial bonds, 30-year bonds, 50-year bonds, 100-year railroad bonds, 100-year bonds. Even the U.S. government bonds 
had gold clauses in them. Now along comes Roosevelt in 1933, and the problem they had was the Federal Reserve System was on a gold clause basis too. The Federal Reserve System originally started on a gold redemption basis, 40% reserve they had to have in gold. That wasn't good enough. That wasn't enough. The thing was so unstable that 40% reserve was not enough. You had the collapse of the banks in 32 and 33, and that was the ultimate liability, was to pay in gold for these notes. And who had that ultimate liability? Well, if the banks didn't pay, the Treasury had to pay because they had interlocked the Federal Reserve with the private banking system. The Treasury was the one that ended up having to pay the gold, and then the Treasury could go after the banks if they wanted to to recoup the value. But remember, it was a depression. So all the bank's assets were collapsing in value. So instead of simply saying, well, we made a terrible mistake with this thing called fractional reserve banking and this cartel structure and tying the Federal Reserve into the Treasury, and we'll, we'll correct that in the same way the Founding Fathers corrected their mistake of putting out the continental currency and so forth. Instead of doing that, they took the opposite tack and said, we'll protect the banks. And they stole the gold from the American people. They reneged on the payment promise, and they stole the gold from the American people, and they actually outlawed gold clauses until 1978. They outlawed the private ownership of gold until 1973. Why did they allow them in 73 and 78? Because they figured by that time people didn't remember. People weren't as smart as they were in 1932, and they were right. They were right, because no sooner did they allow gold ownership, did people start scrambling to get gold? No. As soon as they allowed gold clauses, did people start scrambling to make gold clauses? No. Now, I've spent years looking for these things, and they're very few and far between, and they're only done between people who know exactly what they're doing. And I mean exactly what they're doing. The average person has no conception of this. I go to lectures, I used to go to lectures, uh, an economist would give these lectures uh, about the monetary system, how bad the Federal Reserve was, and so forth and so on. They say, the heart of this whole thing is the Legal Tender Act. If we, if we remove the legal tender power from Federal Reserve notes, everything will be fine. I would come up to them afterwards. I don't want to embarrass them by asking a question in the middle of the lecture. I would come up to them afterwards, and I'd say, listen, did you ever read such and such a statute that allows any individual to make a gold clause contract and therefore get out from under the legal tender provisions that empower the Federal Reserve? Did you ever read? Then they never heard of this statute. These are economists. And I've had this with lawyers, too. I mentioned this to some lawyer. They look at me and give me that kind of dead fish look. And they just never heard of this. Now there you go. So that's an educational problem. In any event, you have taxation, borrowing, spending. I mean, I could add eminent domain to this. Right? They take property from someone, they have to pay them the real market value. Court judgments. If you go into court and <coughs> court, you're hurt. Jury says you're entitled to X thousand dollars. Payable in gold. All right, let them value it in gold or silver. You can turn the entire state onto a gold basis. But this is the key right down here to short circuit the time element. You have to organize the people. Now, if you already had them organized, the fascinating thing to me, if, if, if folks here were organized on a rudimentary basis already, would we have solved this monetary problem years ago? Yes. Wouldn't awesome. have some smart guy come into some of these militia meetings and say, you know what we need to do? We need to start setting up an alternative currency in the state of X or the county of Y or what have you. And they would have done it. And then the ball would have started rolling downhill, if you know what I mean. Because once this kind of process begins, as soon as enough people realize that the paper money side of the ledger is rotting, they start to move to the other side. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. <coughs> All right, now, that brings me back to the final point here, which is the organizational operation. We don't have these structures anywhere in the country. There are a few states that have rudimentary uh, militias. New York is a good example. They have a thing called the New York State Guard, which looks to a certain extent like a real constitutional militia. But it isn't universal 